you worked on a lot of films. Uh, some of my favorites, uh, you know, Nightmare on Elm Street 2 and 3 and 4, all the way to Man's Best Friend, which is, I grew up, oh man, I had that VHS and I like watched it till I burned it out. Um, anything with Lance Henriksen in that era. So, um, like, what's your, like, back then, now, what's your process when you start a new project in terms of like attacking like the creature you're building or what have you? Well, it all starts really with a script. You know, there's, there's, uh, you get the script, you get a call, you get the phone call from a producer or somebody, you know, uh, who's, uh, you know, interested in using you, a director or whatever. And so they'll send a script over. And that's always how it starts with that. So I, re I re break down the script and kind of see what am I making in this film? You know, what am I, what, you know, what am I have to, going to create? And you have to get a budget, a pass. That's the number one thing. Get the money first. And then um, once that's approved, um, then you, it's, it's just meetings. You know, you, you sit and meet with the director. Sometimes the director has a strong, uh, you know, uh, opinion of what he wants. Sometimes he doesn't care. He wants to leave it up to you. I kind of like those directors because you get to be more creative, you know, sometimes with, with uh, less input. But it's always, always good to work with a collaborator that you can, that you respect and that you, you know, think that his work is great. You know, I work with Tim Burton and other, other people who are creative. So it's nice to, to be able to do one-on-one -on -one with somebody else who's creative, you know. A, a lot of times it's the production designer, you know. So we, we start, and then they will submit drawings to you. I like to create things. That back in the 80s and 90s, we were given more freedom than we, we are now. Now it's kind of, you're sort of dictated. A production designer, they'll come in with, I mean, they've got loads and loads and loads of photographs, loads and loads I mean, of, of illustrations coming from, you know, uh, whether it's ILM or whatever. And you're inundated with these you know, 30, 40, 50 things, and you have to kind of, and it's kind of not as fun as it was. In the 80s, they, they left it up to us, and I think it was kind of nice because we got to create everything from scratch, and like the Crypt Keeper was completely my my mind child. Uh, I got to do that. You know, I, I was in a meeting with uh, Joel Silver, and uh, uh, I came, when I came into his office, I look over, and he's trying to, he's in the middle of trying to convince Steven Spielberg, who's sitting on the couch, to be a part of Tales from the Crypt. So I came in, and, and, and Joel was on the phone. He kept, was keeping... Steven Spielberg waiting. I couldn't believe that, number one. Um, so he, uh, we, I came in and sat down, and while I was waiting for Joel, when I was waiting for Joel to, uh, you know, to uh, uh, talk to me, um, I just passed on my, my drawings to Steven. And, you know, he, he, he and I were looking over my drawings and stuff like that. And he picked one. He picked actually, picked, picked actually my least favorite, favorite one himself. But he was like, you know, he was looking through them. And it was just kind of nice to collaborate with him. But anyway, that, that was, a, for example, a... a a creature that I was able to start from pencil to paper, then to sculpture, then to build the entire puppet and animate him, then to direct, write, write some of the things, and then direct him. So he was able to take the whole thing. Then I went on to direct two episodes of Tales from the Crypt. So that was an, an amazing project. So, it, but everything usually starts with a seed. You know, it starts with a script, and then it builds from there. And then you you do I, I do accept input. It's great to have uh, again another creative brain or brains. Like in Child's Play, um, it was like working for Mattel. I mean, they had, we had the production designer, we had we had the director, we had, um, uh, you know, the producers. Everybody had an input, and then you know there was a there was a doll out called Corky at the time, and and Cork, yeah, Corky had a sister named Cricket, and it was an animatronic, it was an animatronic um, uh, toy, I guess at the time that, that actually spoke you know, to kids. Um, and interacted with them or whatever. And so we, we were looking at that as a sample and stuff like that. But it was a huge, long process to get to the final look of Chucky. You know, and um, I have a funny story that I'll tell about the uh, Chucky. We, we, we were comparing my sculpture, which at the time was green clay. It was this green Roma clay. And, uh, and back in the day, we would use eye spheres for the eyeballs temporarily to hold the shape of the, the, the yeah, this, the, yeah uh, full and whatever. We'd build the eye eyelids around the, the, uh, the spheres. And they were made of pink dental acrylic, like gum dental acrylic, like you'd have for false teeth. So you can imagine this green Chucky, all green, great green gray, with pink eyeballs. And uh, so I bring that in, and we sit it up next to the fully colorful uh, Corky doll with curly red hair, cute little dimples. He had all the little freckles and all that stuff, and he was completely finished and looked fantastic. So we they would compare the two, and they would say, "Ah, Corky looks cuter." We're talking about the good guy doll now. Yeah. Corky looks cuter. He looks so much cuter. And I said, no, no, actually, Chucky's form is actually a cuter. He's got more dimples. He's a little chubbier in the face. I said, really, this is a better look. And they wouldn't believe me. And it, this happened two or three times. And I was getting frustrated. So I went back to my, hou uh, to my house, to my, to my studio, and I took the Corky doll that I, they gave me, and I pulled out all his hair, and I took out his eyeballs, and basically took him down to the skin, and I painted it green, gray, Roma clay color. <laughs> and then I took eyeball spheres, pink, and I popped them back in, took that back into the studio, and sat and had a big meeting. And they, you could see right then, they could actually see, okay, 
like looking back and forth. You know, Chucky is a cuter doll now. So, but it, it's 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 all that process of that, and then you get into how do I create, um, you know, the doll, how do I make the doll move, and then how do I perform the doll, you know, like on Child's Play. So uh, you were just asking me about how do I attack a script, fear. <laughs> it's the first thing that comes that comes over you because you're you got to deliver. I mean, especially with child's play. Yeah, how do I do this? How do I, if I don't if I fail? I mean, I, I would imagine actors who have lead uh, a, a big lead in a film feel the same kind of way. They feel they feel um, so much pressure on them. And I thought, oh my god, yeah. And then I've got seven puppeteers that I've got to direct into one character. And there, you know, you've got a guy pulling a. You know, one arm, you got a, you know, three guys in the face, you got a guy in the body, and they're not coordinated. So I, I would demand to have three months, or three months, three weeks uh, rehearsal prior to doing any child's play film. And that really helped us kind of get, just hone into moving together cohesively. And then, you know, and all, you know, and making it a character. Then, then, then the subtleties of, you know, when you're turning a, um, you know, the head of Chucky, instead of just turning it like this. You know, really, you've got to lead with the head, then turn the body. And it, or you've got to, you know, like, you've got to give it attitude. you got to hunch the shoulders and make him look around. So you have to perform. It's hard for seven guys to come together. So yeah. that's what my job on the set was, was to basically act. The director, like Ronnie Yu and Brida Chucky, would I'd, I'd sit right next to him. And he'd go, Kevin, Kevin, I want you to do this and this and this. And I want Chucky to, to laugh and then bite her in the neck or whatever it was. So I go, okay, great. And I had to go down to the puppeteers and go, I'd have to act it out for them. Yeah. And then if one guy wasn't, you know, moving the arm, I'd have to individually give direction. It was super tough. I mean, so I, I mean, look back now, I don't know if I could do it in my old age. I don't know if I could actually sit there and, and do all the work that I did because that was four films worth, you know. And uh, so anyway, uh, you, when you start a project, you start with, with fear, <laughs> you know, which pushes into adrenaline, which pushes into, you know, you know, how do I make this work? And then just meetings and meetings and meetings and meetings. And it takes months and months to prepare and, and uh weeks to, you know, to prep and then the shooting and stuff. So it doesn't all happen overnight. But, you know, you do, there's a lot of sleepless nights, you know, worrying about how, how, to, how to pull this off and stuff like that. But it's also exhilarating. It's fun. And it's great to create. And that's what the driving force is, is really to, to you know, just to have fun and, and make movies. And so that's what pushes you on. And now that I'm an old man and jaded, you know, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't have had the energy to, to do it all over again. Anyway. No, that's great. And, and I mean, you spoke about Chucky, and you know you are here with this whole Chucky family, and obviously you met your wife on on the set. So there's this whole series obviously must mean a lot to you, um, in terms of the fans, in terms of what it's meant to you in your career, and just personally, can just like outside of the technology, what more has it meant to you on that on that front? Well, again, like you said, you know, I, I was able to meet my wife, which led to my daughter. So I have a family, and Chucky bought my house. So I live I live in Bel Air now. You know, it's a nice nice home in Bel Air because of Child's Play. So financially and and you know and then family wise, it was it was a blessing. It was such a huge thing. I mean, um, you know, it's just it's it's changed my life. You know, and then to, then to come to some place like Frightmare and and in, here in Texas and and be able to share that with you and other people and see the excitement that people have for this you know creature that I had a part in making. You know, again, Don Mancini was the original writer. You know, he's the you know, the godfather of the whole thing, you know, he, he was his brainchild, you know, that led to all these films, you know, he's here, you know, he made a last minute show, I don't know if you got a chance to interview him, but if you do, oh, okay, yeah, do you, do you get to set something up? Okay, good, yeah, yeah, and, uh, you know, so, you know, it takes a village to do all this stuff, but, but it's been, it's been a, a great ride, and it, and it's, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I can't imagine my life without, you know, Chucky in it, you know, which is strange to say. Um, but uh, I haven't done the last three films. You know, I just did up to four. Um, but uh, I, I could talk about that too if you want. Yeah, if, if you, um, I mean, that, that came down to people asking, "How can we not doing the franchise anymore?" Uh, you know, uh, makeup artist named uh, Tony Gardner does it now, and it came down to uh, uh, the uh, changing of the guards or changing of the of the ownership went from Universal to Focus Features, and they, I think, wanted a fresh start. I mean, they were making it difficult for me to set a deal because in, in my original deal back in the 80s and 90s you create thing when you create animatronics you do, do things with secrets in them you know trade secrets and you everybody in their contract would write in that you know the producers can have or the uh, studio can keep the skins uh the wardrobe whatever if they want even though i still have all that stuff but I get to keep the inner mechanism for to keep you know to trade secrets and all that stuff. So we had that built into our contract. When Focus came on, you know, this is, I mean, we did we did Bride of Chuck, and I think it was ten years before they did Seed, or something like that. Um, it was a while. Uh, 
they didn't like that. They wanted to own everything. And it was just how things were done in the 80s and 90s. So I didn't want to change that part of the deal. So they finally agreed to that. And then I then they hit me with budget constraints that were almost it made it really impossible. I came down so, I, I mean, try to get the prices down as low as I could, even where I wasn't really making anything, but um, just to pay for my shop and the build. And I was trying to do the quality that I, I did in the, in the first four films. And they really made it difficult to do that. Then the kicker, the final thing that kind of put the nail in the coffin for the, on that was they asked me to use all um, Romanian puppeteers because we were shoot, they shot that in Romania. And I said, well, I have to bring at least three you know, guys to do the face. The mouth is very important. Um, I think I can teach other people how to do stuff. And they said, no, no, it's, ev- it's everybody and just you. You know, all, all Romanian people. And I just, you know, and it was that. And then there was some other sort of shifty things with uh, weird tax things that were going on. They wanted me to ship empty boxes there. It was just this weird thing. And they were, and they were, I think that they were just wanted a fresh start. I just think they wanted to have a clean slate, start with somebody who they could control in, in, a, in a sense that, that uh, you know, Tony would come on as a fresh thing and probably would do anything he needed to do to make that, to make that, that show work. So, so it was, it was one of those situations and, and, uh, it just didn't work out, you know, and it's unfortunate, but, um, I miss it, you know, and it was hard because it was, uh, you know, it was my, uh, my, it was my baby. You need to knock on the door, go right ahead, rap on that door. So, um, yeah, anyway, that's, that's how it, it turned out. And uh, I did, you know, it was, it was hard to give up. It was my wife and I were funny enough. We we're talking about this last night. Um, we we did a screening uh, across town with the whole the whole group and uh, did a did a little uh, you know, a Q and A afterwards and you know I was talking to her later about you know, about that kind of thing. I said it was she said, that's the first time I've ever talked to you about missing a child like like you really were hurt by it. I said I was I was hurt by it because you you it's your baby it's what you created. I mean you know you from the ground up you were part of it and now someone's just going to take it and and do it again and it's like without you my designs you know they see to chucky had the bride and and tiffany with this you know or, or the bride uh, uh, you know uh, chucky with the you know the scars and stuff like that and the staples in his skin and it was very strange to 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 deal with i got over that but it was the first film was very very tough to to kind of deal with so i got a couple uh fan questions from strange oddities uh the first one is from edgar rogers thanks for sending your question um who hello edgar uh, if you're here from Texas Frightmare, uh, who is one of your favorite actors or actresses to work with that you have in your uh, in in horror films or just anything? I guess um, gosh, uh, favorite. There's there's a lot I don't like. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> there's only a couple I don't like. Most everybody in in, in show business is is pretty cool. Um, there were a couple of of ones uh, I won't mention uh, their names, but their initials are. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Johnny Depp was awesome. I mean, we did uh, uh, Sleepy Hollow together. We wanted to do a film called Blow. I, I worked a little bit with him on on uh, um, Astronaut's Wife, mostly with Charlize Theron. Charlize Theron was cool, uh, really awesome. Um, uh, you know, kind of tomboyish in, in her in her personality. Um, uh, she's a beautiful woman, you know, but also kind of a guy guy in a sense of you know like a you know um, you know seems like she, I had a you know, I don't I never had a drink with her, but it seemed like she had be a fun person to have a drink with. Um, but uh, I think I think uh, Johnny Depp, uh, Nick Cage, Joel, John Travolta, those guys were were awesome. You know, um, you know. I guess it would be Johnny Depp probably would be the coolest guy I would think. But they're all they're all cool. That's really funny. Cause that was actually the next fan question uh, from Sh- uh, Sherry Bravo. Hello, Sherry. Uh, how was it working with Johnny Depp in the film Blow and Sleepy Hollow? So he kind of already answered the question. So reiterating, yeah. you really enjoyed it. Well, yeah, I, I had um, uh, funny because Johnny and I had this sort of this weird connection. My brother wa- had done the pilot for 21 Jump Street as the actor, as Johnny's, as Johnny's part. And uh, for circumstances, he, uh, the, the head of the studio wanted Johnny Depp from the get-go. The producers went ahead and hired Jeff. They shot the pilot, my brother Jeff. Uh, he's excellent in it, by the way. And uh, I, saw the, I saw the pilot. Um, but then the, he w- the studio wouldn't green light it unless they switched out, which happens a lot. Um, a lot of politics and things in, in the film business. So they switched it out with Johnny Depp. And, you know, Johnny has had this great career. Now, Johnny would, would have probably had the great career anyway. It doesn't matter. But um, so we, we talked about that. It was like one of the first things we talked about on set. He said, do you have a brother named Jeff? I said, yes, yes. And uh, you replaced him. And so we got, you know, we laughed a little bit about that. He, not, not, in, not at Jeff's expense, but um, we, we t- touched base with, about that. And then... Um, he was just a cool guy. I mean, he's just, he's amazingly, like what you see in his interviews, that's the kind of guy he is. Um, he's just laid back, super sweet, you know. 
Um, sometimes hard to get to outside of the movies. Like I, I try to contact him, had to go through several channels because they have, you know, uh, an entourage of people that, you know, protect them and all that stuff. Uh, but uh, he gave me his, you know, personal emails and we went back and forth. He actually, I, I wrote a children's book that he endorsed for me. Oh. And so on the back of the, of the quote, I got, I got Nick Cage and, and Johnny Depp. It, the book is called Heavily. Uh, it came out two weeks after 9-11, uh, so it didn't do very well. You know, the, uh, uh, the whole... Uh, you know, country wasn't buying Christmas gifts that year. It came out in in like November, so it and the and the and the company ended up tanking within six months. So it was too bad, but they, they endorsed it. And so he was just a really cool guy. You know, he was just a a great guy, just like what you'd think he would be. Um, awesome. You know, uh, funny stories. You know, uh, I think he appreciates you know people who work hard. And, you know, and 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 you know try to do the best for him. So uh, we got along great. And I have to ask about. I mean, we're we're here for Chucky. We got to ask about Freddie. As well, uh, I would just, I couldn't not, you know, and uh, obviously, I it would be four total films you worked with Robert England on? Uh, let's see, uh, I did two, three, four, and then the TV series. Okay. Yeah. And then were you on um, Fan of the Opera as well? Yes. Yeah. Yes, That's yeah. Well. And I did Robert's uh, film, ni uh, 976 Evil. Right, right, right. right. So, yeah, and, and, and funny thing is, I hadn't seen Robert since my wedding, which was, almost 28 years ago last year it was 27 years i came to my wedding and we just and i had stopped doing nightmare on elm street films with him and we just never reconnected it was kind of we just fell away we were great friends of course you become very close with your with your subjects whoever you're putting makeup on and they they with their makeup artists or hairdressers it is a lot of time together and you get and you're breaking that space you know you're we're, you know we're a distance apart but when you're doing makeup you're right against them you know you're, you're nose to nose you know, they're smelling each other's breath, you know, you're, you know, whatever, first thing in the morning at five o'clock in the morning, you know, you're, they get your worst, you know, you're seeing, you know, this actors, you're t tired, you know, when you, so you become friends pretty fast. So we, but I, I ran into him at Monster Palooza and uh, he, he was signing autographs and they came over and he had a huge line out the door. It's just crazy how that, you talk about how it's, things have changed in, in conventions. It was just amazing. And then this, you know, whatever he's making, every convention he does is, is incredible. But he just this huge line, and he's being very nice and talking to, uh, you know, some people that he was signing for. And I leaned over, and I just said, um, I just cut line, and I kind of leaned over and said, uh, if you get a moment, can you, uh, can you say hi to an old friend? And he said, and he didn't look up. He just, uh-huh, sure. He thought he was talking to a, somebody who was helping the, in the show. And he said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. Yeah, okay, my, no problem. I go, uh, the old friend is me. And he went, and he stopped signing, just looked up, and he went. And it took him a second, because we hadn't seen each other for so long, and we changed he hasn't changed but i've changed and he looked at me because i was just a kid you know when i did those films and um he looked up it took him a second and my brother jeff who started with him in a tv show called v oh, yeah. um oh, yeah. so we were just sort of standing there looking at him and uh and he went oh my god and just got up and we hugged him and unfortunately we held we held the line up for 15 minutes 20 minutes and probably peeved a few people off but it was great to see to see robert you know um yeah, I mean, yeah, I did. I did two, uh, uh, which is my favorite makeup out of the whole series. I think. I think because it looks, it looks the most sinister. Like yeah, and his eyes. He had the contact lenses yeah. him, which I didn't use in the in the future films because you know they're just not comfortable. You know, I mean, they're they're and it, there's dirt and dust and you know every Nightmare on Elm Street film is so much smoke, and it just irritated his eyes. And so, and and the in the third one, Dream Warriors, he was supposed to be becoming more human or more like Robert. So we took them out, and I kind of regret that, you know. Now, when we got to we got to four, we just didn't. I don't think we no. We went, went with no lenses too. But I tried to. Oh, so the look of two, I uh, three, I tried to make more like Robert. So he lost that bone structure that I, I really wanted to have said this before, but Robert to look like a like a male witch sort of with a hooked nose and and more prominent bones than he had in the first film that Dave Miller did. I was trying to you know just do my thing to it, you know, and I I feel good about that makeup and then we did three and it had to be look more like robert so it's more like scar tissue on robert less form you know kind of took that some of that down so by four i tried to bring that look back as much as i could and uh, uh i turned over the, the makeup brains to howard berger who runs k&b you know and they do uh, walking dead now and the orville um i'm giving them plugs but uh um yeah so uh he applied for me on, on that show, but I hadn't seen Robert for so many years, and then I ran into him. It was so great to see him again. So hopefully we can. He's not here uh, this weekend, but hopefully we can, we can hook up. But it was it was it was a lot of fun working on that. And again, you know, it's weird when you're young. You're you're just doing everything you can to to do a good job. You're not thinking about what it means in your career or what or that that you're, this character that you're building or doing is going to become huge. I mean, they didn't know what they had with the first one, so I had no even even pictures of Freddie at all. 
I had a couple little pictures to go from, and and I, they were unclear really what what uh, Dave had done. So I kind of had to make up what I did on my own. Um, and then by the two, they knew what they had. So they were they were you know that's why there's so many fo- photographs of of Freddie uh, you know, from part two. We did tons of promotion, went all over the country, you know, promoting the movie. And then three was even bigger. I think my I, I have a fondness for two, but. I think uh, three Dream Warriors I liked a lot. I just liked the experience. There was a lot of fun things we did. The Freddy Snake and stuff like that was was fun to do. But uh, um, you know, anyway. And then four was again, you know, again, I wasn't on set very much and and uh, wasn't a part of that much. But uh, anyway, that was my that was my nightmare. No, that's great. I three is easily my favorite. Uh, yeah, and I. I took some friends. I showed it on thirty five millimeter back in, in the Plaza Theater in Atlanta, and we just like a lot of them hadn't seen it. And it was like it went over like gangbusters, you know. And I had a book called uh, "Men Makeup and Monsters" when I was a kid. And I remember they had the picture, I think, of people actually uh, working the snake machine. And I, yeah, and I just remember it's like, you know, how'd they do that? And you know, I was very terrified of that, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You did your job well. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, last question would just be: you were saying before about like how. It can, like you, you see a script and like you have that fear, yeah. you know, but then you have that exhilaration of yeah. like something. It's the, fear, it's the fear of can I deliver? Yeah, it's not the fear of this. I mean, the scripts can be scary, but I yeah. mean, it's the fear of, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like the fear of like, you know, can I give what is needed? But like out of pretty much all the films you've worked on, what is like one thing that was like you saw it on the page and you're like, this is so difficult. I have no idea I'm going to do this. And then the result was the opposite where it just was. It ended up being kind of drawing something from you in that way. Well, I mean, um, almost every film I do, except except the the ones that you do films and you go, okay, I know how to blow up a head, I know how to I know how to sever a neck, you know, or, or whatever. I know how to, uh, you know, make a hand move or whatever. Or, or, or a lot of times, like I did Twelve Years of Bones on Fox, and so not that that film was or that that show was easy, but we only had three days to build everything, and, and so we had to come up with real quick ways to to do stuff. Um, that was difficult in itself, but as far as what we were doing, it wasn't that difficult. Meaning it was more like glorified props you know in a sense they weren't puppets anymore right. but but they were you know effects and things like that and severed heads and corpses and things like that but almost you know in the 80s and 90s even into in the 2000s um every every show seemed to have something that i thought how am i going to pull this off right. i mean an astronaut's wife we had to make you know rod puppeted uh, animatronic um fetus babies inside a giant womb so i had to build a giant womb room I called it the womb room, and it was about the size of the room that we're here with the walls, so the camera could get inside of it and then turn in different directions. And it also had to be lit and translucent, had veins in it and stuff like that. Hugely difficult, you know, as far as to build this womb, even though that wasn't necessarily a makeup effect. It was part of this puppet's environment. These puppets, you know, it was uh, the fetuses, I mean. Um, but almost everything, the Freddy Snake, for example, was, I thought, how are we going to pull this off? I had to, We had to use... Our own, you know, I had my own mechanical team that did the face and stuff. But when it came to the, the body coming up out of the floor and, and the, you know, the, the rig that raised up the, the, the snake, that was special effects, the mechanical effects on set that did all that stuff as far as the rigs to lift this heavy body up. Hydraulics. Hydraulics and then, and then the, the, you know, the air cannons that would shoot up, you know, shoot the snake up with her on it, with yeah. a stunt woman on it and things like that. Or going through the wall, you know, breaking apart the, the wall as the snake went along the wall. That was all special effects mechanical stuff. So I handled... Of course, the skins and all that stuff, but I'll, and also handled the the reverse shot um, that we did of, her, of him swallowing up, of Freddie Snake swallowing up Patricia Arquette. Um, what it was was basically um, they wanted to, to push it on, and I, you know, thought about it early on in, in pre-production. I thought we can't we can't do it. And I tried, I've done did tests, and and you just you can't get rubber no matter how much KY jelly you put on stuff. You can't get a rubber to push onto somebody. And she was, you know, a young girl, but she was a woman. She had you know hips and everything, so. You know, she. It was hard to push it on. I said we'd try it, but I came into the meetings and said, "Look, look. The only way we can really do this is to reverse pull it off." And um, I had a you know meeting with Roy Wagner, the the, the DP, and he was n- you know very um, he had a negative opinion about my my wanting to pull it off. He said it will never work. The the, the hair and the clothing are going to reverse and it's going to look funny. They're going to look number one. It's a dream though, so everything is kind of weird like that anyway. It's okay to reverse, but I was trying to explain that to him. I said it's okay, but he said no, it just won't work. So um, he said we're going to have to push it on. And I said okay, right. I said but do this for me. Can we just try it? The last thing was let's try to do what we what you want the best we can. And then let's reverse it because I can get it. I can get I, by pulling it. I can get big gobbles in reverse to, to have the snake be pulled off like this, and then have it go back on. By pushing it, you're you know, again you're pushing this rubber thing onto a body. It just wasn't working. 
So um, he said, okay, fine, we'll, we'll try it your way. And uh, well, he came out of dailies the next, the next day, and he turned to me, and he said, I want to apologize to you. That, that reverse shot really worked well, you know, and I always knew it would because I'd done a lot of stuff like that. When you're in, in, you know, we're kind of like magicians in a sense that we do, we're doing tricks, and so we have to figure out ways to do stuff, reversing, um, forced perspective, all kinds of different old, old school camera tricks. And uh, we, uh, you know, he, he, he was nice enough that he came up later, and uh, Chuck Russell, the director, describes it. I saw a video on uh, when Nightmare on Elm Street video came out uh, about five years ago. And he said that the, the, the snake was not working. He said the snake wasn't working, so we had to do it in reverse. That's not what happened. I mean, and it was it sort of angered me because uh, he wasn't around, number one. He wasn't around. It was just between Roy and I that made the decision. And I came in with the lead of saying we're going to have to reverse this. So, you know, um, anyway, that was a difficult thing. But a lot of movies, I mean, I'm trying to think of, uh, gosh, there's just been so many. hardest thing I've ever done is direct, you know. Um, as far as like the amount of pressure that's on you, but um, I, I think I think really truly like maybe Child's Play Four, Bride of Chucky was so difficult because there were two characters. By the way, I just met Brad Dura for the first time what? ever yesterday. We're talking to him in a couple hours. Okay, <laughs> Brad. Brad, uh, he. Uh, I've always been, I've listened to thousands of hours of him doing Chucky's voice. We've puppeteered him. We take our lead of how Chucky is by how he delivers his lines. I mean, he is Chucky. Um, you know, when I was designing Chucky, uh, you know, uh, the Corky doll I talked about had brown eyes and cur curly red hair. And I wanted to make him colder. And so I, I said, I talked to David Kirshner. I said, let's do blue eyes. And I said, I want him to go into, as they get become real, um, you know, I want it to be kind of ice blue. I said, it'd be great if we had an actor who had blue eyes. And then David said, oh, we do. And he showed me a picture of Brad Dourif. And I was like, from Cuckoo's Next. Yes, that's great. And he had these ice cold blue eyes. So it worked out great. Uh, anyway, I forgot what I was saying. Um, um, about. Oh, yeah. So, so last night I walked up and again, thank you. I, I, I you know, I heard the, uh, uh, you know, his voice you know, thousands. I feel like I know him. I've seen him in interviews and, and again, but I'd never met the man. And I walked up to him and I said, Brad, I, we've never met. And, um, I, last night at, at dinner, and I said, uh, you know, I've, uh, you know, I said it's just weird that I've never met you. And he said, I, I, I feel like I know you because he's watching me in interviews, talking about Chucky and stuff like that. But we actually never met until last night. It was kind of cool. But uh, anyway, I don't know where that was going. But uh, <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, uh, thank you so much for sitting down with us. It's been really fun yeah. talking with you. And uh, yeah, no, and I, I think uh, I think it's going to sound pretty nice. So uh, thanks for being here with us. And uh, strangely, Oddities here at Texas Frightmare. And thanks so much.